Welcome to the CAA 2022 webinar series. Today's webinar is real-time clinical feedback to improve clinical practice, presented by Dr. Graham McClelland and Dr. Ziad Neem, proudly supported by Zoll. Thank you for joining us and please enjoy. Hi, I'm David Waters and I'm the Chief Executive of the Council of Ambulance Authorities. Welcome to the latest in our webinar series and today's webinar is titled Real-Time Clinical Feedback to Improve Clinical Practice. Today, we are joined by Dr. Graham McClelland and Dr. Ziad Neem as they discuss real-time clinical feedback. This webinar is supported by Zoll, whom we thank for their ongoing commitment to the CAA. Dr. McClelland will discuss the impact of introducing real-time feedback on ventilation rate and volume in a simulated cardiac arrest scenario, presenting results from the VANS study. Dr. Neem will discuss the effect of providing real-time performance feedback and team performance benchmarking reports on clinical practice. At the end of the presentations, both presenters will join us for a live Q&A, so feel free to hold on to your questions to the end or pop them into the chat function for the presenters to answer. So our first speaker today is Dr. Graham McLennan, who is a paramedic research fellow with North East Ambulance Service and a visiting clinical researcher at Newcastle University on a postdoctoral scholarship. Graham joined the North East Ambulance Service Research and Development Department in 2011, working on the head injury transportation straight to neurosurgery trial in what he thought would be a short secondment. A few years later, following that, he completed a National Institute for Health Research Clinical academic training fellowship and a master's in clinical research with Newcastle University. In 2018, Graham submitted his PhD at Newcastle University Institute of Neuroscience, focused on pre-hospital identification of stroke mimics. Graham is also a member of the College of Paramedics Research Committee and editor of the British Paramedic Journal. Today, Graham will talk to us about the impact of introducing real-time feedback on ventilation rate and volume in a simulated cardiac arrest scenario, the VAN study. Welcome, Graham. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Graham McClelland. I'm a research paramedic working with the Northeast Ambulance Service here in the UK, and also a researcher attached to the Stroke Research Group at Newcastle University. I'm gonna talk you through a study we completed a couple of years ago now, the VAN study, looking at the ventilation accuracy in the Northeast using Zoll feedback. For a bit of context, my service is one of 10 English ambulance services. We're one of the smaller regional ambulance services okay, over here. So although we cover quite a large geographical area, we're actually one of the smaller services. We're still delivering one, over one and a half million calls per year. So we're, we're kept pretty busy. We're primarily a paramedic led service. So nearly every vehicle will have paramedic on. Most vehicles are double crewed ambulances or do have some rapid response um, cars which are solo crewed with paramedics as well but most of our vehicles are other more traditional double crewed ambulances. Most paramedics are BSc degree educated and certainly all the newer paramedics are and that's an ongoing change across the whole of the UK but just for a little bit of context in, in what our service is and how we're set up. So what this study was about was ventilations and ventilations as part of CPR delivered during resuscitation. So we know that across England, we resuscitate somewhere in the region of 30,000 patients each year out of a total number of arrests attended, which is a little more than double that. And we know that we want to deliver high quality CPR when we're resuscitating these patients. And high quality CPR involves not just the compressions where we get feedback, we get live feedback from as we use, telling us how deep, how fast we're compressing, and that's useful, that improves the quality of the compressions we're doing. But there's also the ventilation aspect of delivering CPR, and actually we don't have, certainly historically, we haven't had the same type of feedback, the same type of data. We haven't known how good or bad we are at delivering ventilations. And without feedback, without data on this, we really we don't know, we're blind to how good we are. This is something we're all trained in, we all do. But when you're at an arrest situation and you're thinking through reversible causes and you're thinking through scene management and drug dosages and everything else, how 
much focus and how much attention do we give to each individual ventilation? How good we, are we at delivering it? And that's what this study is about. The literature, and there's a little bit of literature out there on this, suggests that actually we paramedics and emergency services people aren't brilliant at delivering ventilations and certainly not ventilations according to the guidelines. We tend to under or over ventilate, more often over ventilate patients. How much under or over ventilating contributes towards patient outcome is difficult to isolate and amongst all the other things going on in a resuscitation scenario. But it makes sense and has face value that actually if we can get the ventilations delivered according to the guidelines, then it should contribute towards better outcomes. It's what we're aiming for, even if it's difficult to isolate the individual impact. But the literature suggests we're not brilliant at doing this. What is helps and what is the core of this study is this little device, a BVM sensor developed by Zoll. So this fits into our defibrillators that we use. And what it does is it gives live feedback on each and every ventilation that you deliver. So it goes into the airway circuit, cable connected to the, the monitor, the defibrillator, and it gives us live feedback on both rate and volume of ventilation. So it allows us to collect data and see how good or bad we are. And what this looks like, if you can see down in the bottom corner of the screen with the orange header is BVM feedback there. So it's telling you the volume in mills of each breath you're delivering. It's giving you a countdown to keep you ventilating at the rate you set, and it's giving you the average rate you're delivering at. And they're also nicely color coded. The green shows that you're within the guidelines that you've set. So you can see if the color changes, then you're outside of the guidelines you set. So a little bit of feedback. You can see there's the feedback there on the compressions as well and set up from the monitor. But that's what this feedback looks like in real practice. And we first heard about this back in October of 2019, when Zoll came over and demonstrated this capability to um, a number of us within NAS. And we saw the potential through where we thought actually that would be really useful. One, because we don't know how good or bad we are, and two, because we think it could help us improve. So over the Christmas 2019, we put together the, the VAN study and we were ready to go by February 2020. As you may remember, in around March 2020, things went a bit Strange, pandemic, COVID, everything got a bit busy for ambulance services and the rest of the healthcare. So the study was actually delayed and didn't launch until September 2020. So nearly a year after we first heard about this, we finally got to launch the study. And what the study aimed to do was determine whether introducing ventilation feedback could improve compliance with the recommended rate and volume of ventilation. And we did this in a simulated setting. So we did this using mannequins rather than jumping straight onto real patients. We wanted to want to collect the data around how good we were at the start and to see whether this looked like it would make any difference before we jump towards those clinical trials. And based on a 50% um, compliance, we needed 98 participants to power the study on that. This is what we set out to do. What the study looked like was we got paramedics and clinicians who were on their annual training update, whether extracted from duty good or training center and get updated on the latest guidelines and refresh their ALS skills. So we got the clinicians after they'd done an ALS refresher as part of the annual update, put them through a two minute scenario without any feedback, but recording the quality of the ventilations, demonstrated the DVM technology, showed them how it worked, gave them a chance to become familiar with it, and then repeated said two minute scenario with feedback this time. Both times we did the scenario, we had one clinician doing compressions and one doing ventilations and switched them over. So we got sort of two participants each time we ran the scenario and each person got a chance to ventilate. And then at the end of the scenario, we asked to complete a small survey to give us some, some feedback on what they thought of this. Um, device and add-on and capability. We ended up running the study in this training vehicle parked outside of our training center because of social distancing. We couldn't actually get a room within the building to run this, but we used the back of the ambulance, which actually worked quite well for us as a nice self-contained little place to, to run the study. And we would lure clinicians in between sessions and on the lunch break to the ambulance with sweets and biscuits and promise of certificates for their portfolios, and we didn't struggle to get willing volunteers to come and 
try out this device. What this looked like inside, so we had the mannequin, we had a, an eye gel, a supraglottic airway in place, the ventilation circuit in place with the, the ventilation bag, and um, a, a puck to record the chest compressions as well as a secondary outcome, looking for any change in those with people concentrating on the ventilation. And then the monitor up at the top of the screen there, you can see set up on the bracket so everybody could see what was going on. Once we launched the study, as I say, we had no problem getting participants. We got 118 participants over 10 days, so we exceeded the target, but we did have to exclude a number for um, technical issues and failures in data capture by ourselves. So we ended up with 106 clinicians included in the study. These 106 clinicians, slightly more males and females, range of ages, three to one paramedics to non-paramedics, mean that the service of 12 years. And this was a reasonably experienced cohort. This was, you know, this was a people who have been largely in the role for a while and ventilating somewhere around once a month as part of their normal practice, according to the, the, the data we collected, although with a huge range in there depending on role and how long we've been in the job. So that was what the participants looked like in this. So based on that 50% compliance with the targeting, 9% of those participants were able to deliver ventilations over 50% compliant with the guidelines. So 9% of the participants were delivering ventilations 50% compliant with the guidelines without feedback. Once we added in the feedback, that jumped to 91%. So we went from hardly anybody to nearly everybody able to deliver ventilations with rate and volume more than 50% compliant with the guidelines. And that was statistically significant, although with a difference like that, the, the statistics are a little bit um, cherry on top, really. I think you can tell the difference without the statistics. So it looked like it made a huge difference. Let me start breaking down this data. So the blue bars on the left are without feedback, the orange bars on the right with feedback. And you can see that actually, not just the sort of average ability to deliver half of them, half of the ventilations as they're supposed to, but actually the whole spread moved. Mo many more people were delivering much better ventilations. Very few were delivering poor quality ventilations and vice versa. So a, a dramatic swing on that primary outcome. Looking at the rate and volume individually, so with our target volume is 550 mils, plus or minus 50. So the mean volume or the median volume without feedback was 623 mils. The median volume with feedback was 546. So an obvious change to outside of guidelines, inside of guidelines there. But actually, when you look at the range, the spread of volume. Some people were hardly ventilating at all. Some people were massively over ventilating in volume. And the feedback narrowed that range dramatically and got the vast majority of people delivering within guidelines. So we, we eliminated the extreme outliers and got more people delivering volume, the appropriate volume with the ventilations. So another way to look at that, so these color-coded charts, so red is over-ventilating, green is within guidelines, blue is under-ventilating. At the top, we've got without feedback, bottom with feedback. And just looking at the colors, you can see in the bottom, it's mostly green to most people are delivering most of the ventilations within the guidelines. In the top, you can see actually there's a lot more red in there. It's predominantly red. Most people were over-ventilating, delivering high volume ventilations. And some people were delivering all of the ventilations at, at, at high volumes. So it's another way of representing the same sort of data. But again, you can see the dramatic shift that happened. If we look at the rates now, so if you take the average rate, so the median rate without feedback was 10, the median rate with feedback was nine. So if you just looked at the averages, actually you wouldn't see much of a difference. But again, if you look at the range and the spread of, of um, rates, adding feedback in narrows that dramatically and gets the vast majority of people delivering at the right rate. It eliminates those outliers. And some people were delivering nearly 30 ventilations a minute, which is 
that takes some effort to do 30 ventilations a minute. And that is, there's no doubt about that, is massively overventilating somebody. But adding the feedback in eliminates those outliers, eliminates the extremes, gets the vast majority of people delivering ventilations within the guidelines that we set, which was 10 plus or minus two. And these guidelines are based on the European resource guidelines at the time. And again, we have the color coded chart showing most people were overvent or more people were overventilated in terms of high rate without feedback. And then with feedback, as you can see, it, it's an eye on all green across there. So, yeah. We had a couple of secondary outcomes in this study. So, we looked at the difference between the paramedics and the non paramedics. And whilst the paramedics at baseline, were better both without and with feedback. Actually, the difference, the improvement is the same whether the paramedics or non paramedics. So, again, we weren't powered on this. This was a secondary outcome, um, but it seems to improve the performance of everybody, um, regardless of job role, which is good to see. Another secondary outcome. So, we had the measuring the chest compression quality. Chest compression fraction, very good. This was only a two minute scenario. So actually people should be able to deliver chest compressions for two minutes, you would hope. Depth, now the depth improved between having no feedback and having feedback. Again, we're not powered on this secondary outcome. Whether this was due to people paying more attention to the monitor and the feedback from the monitor on the second time when they had the feedback, whether it was just familiarity with with the scenario, a learning effect, getting more comfortable doing chest compressions, difficult to say, but certainly no deterioration in quality of, of chest compressions, which is what we were concerned about. And with regards to rate, very little difference there, still around the three quarters delivering appropriate rate of chest compression. So no evidence of a dramatic drop off in chest compression quality by adding in extra feedback and something else to take note of on the monitor is good, reassuring. So we delivered a, a survey, we collected a little bit of sort of feedback from the participants at the end of the study. And um, the vast majority of people thought the device was beneficial. The vast majority said they would always use it in practice. Most people thought that the training, the brief explanation we gave them was sufficient and we literally trained them in five minutes. Here is the bag, this is what it looks like. Have a squeeze, you can see how it changes. This wasn't a long training program. This was a brief explanation and most people thought that was enough. People generally thought it was easy to apply in practice or very easy to apply in practice. A few changes people suggested around sort of audible feedbacks and not just having the visual, whether this could be combined into sort of one device with the, so we've got a CO2 monitor on the airway circuit and then this, so we were concerned about sort of stacking more and more units in there, whether it could be combined. Um, whether it could be adjusted depending on patient size. So these are a few sort of comments made by a small number of people. But the, and when we asked sort of people just in the general feedback, it was overwhelmingly positive about the device and about the feedback and about how they thought this would be useful in practice. So qualitative feedback, survey feedback, very positive. So at the end of the study, I was one of a team delivering this and we were very, very pleased. We thought this was a great outcome very positive data, useful for us, positive trial, successful study, very happy. So this has now been published. It was published in Resuscitation Plus Journal last year with the lead author of Carl Charlton, who's one of my colleagues. So the paper's out there with more details if you want to go and read about it. But we do recognize this has a number of limitations. It was a mannequin study. It was only a two minute scenario. They were only doing ventilations and compressions. They weren't concentrating on the myriad other factors that you have to think about at these settings. It was in an ambulance. So the dummy was on a trolley. It wasn't on the floor. They weren't you know, in the many places where you find somebody where you do end up ventilating them. There may have been a learning effect because people got a chance to do a scenario without feedback then a bit of training. Then they got to do a scenario with feedback. So there's a number of limitations to the study. But we have now moved on to a clinical study using this in practice. So the VANS 2 study is currently running in Northeast Ambulance Service, and we will have the results of that 
um, later in 2022. So hopefully look out for those being published and presented later on. But we, based on the Vans one, we've now moved on to a, a clinical study because of the, the impact and the, the signal of benefit and certainly improvement in compliance with guidelines we saw there. There's a number of people to thank and acknowledge and say I'm part of a team with my colleagues, Carl, Karen, Dan, Paul and Michael, who ran this within Northeast. We were supported by Zoll, who gave us the equipment to deliver this, although they had no input into the study analysis, the data, the results of the presentation, but they did support the study with the, the device and the technology. And all my colleague at Northeast Ambulance Service, who participated and gave us their time and their data and contribute to the study because we couldn't do any of this research without them. So I suppose take home messages I would leave you with is the BVM has got to be one of the most common universal pieces of kit on ambulances certainly across the UK and I imagine across the world but without data without good data on how good we are at using this. How, how do you know? How do you know how good you are at ventilating without data? And I would say, if you get a chance to collect it and use that to improve your practice, that's a great thing to do. Thank you very much. Our second speaker today is Dr. Ziad Neem. Dr. Neem is a paramedic and a Heart Foundation Future Leader Fellow with expertise in pre-hospital emergency care and resuscitation research. He has over 100 publications in leading international journals and has attracted a number of competitive research grants. He holds appointments as research fellow at the Department of Epidemiology and Preventative Medicine, Monash University, and as an honorary senior research fellow at the Center of Research and Evaluation at Amlitz, Victoria. Also an adjunct senior lecturer at the Department of Paramedicine in Monash University. He's also an international associate editor for the Journal of Pre-Hospital Emergency Care and associate editor for the Journal of Australian Emergency Care and an editorial board member of the journals Resuscitation and Resuscitation Plus. Today, Ziad will talk to us about why out-of-hospital cardiac arrests are the most challenging cases attended by paramedics and how Amrex Victoria has launched routine post-resuscitation debriefing reports using improved functionality embedded into the Victorian Ambulance Cardiac Arrest Registry that utilizes over 19 metrics based on guidelines to provide feedback on attempted resuscitations in Victoria. Welcome, Ziad. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ziad Nemi. I'm a, a paramedic and a senior research fellow at Ambulance Victoria and a National Heart Foundation Future Leader Fellow at Monash University. And for most of my early career, I've had a, a deep passion for cardiac arrest and resuscitation research. And so I'm incredibly pleased to be able to share with you today uh, what we've been able to do over the last 18 months in the way of implementing a post-resuscitation or post-cardiac arrest debriefing report in the state of Victoria. So I do have a conflict of interest that I want to share with you today. I hold a number of government and non-government grants uh, targeting resuscitation quality improvement programs in Victoria, uh, of which some of those do overlap with today's talk on post-cardiac arrest debriefing. So if many of you will understand the uh, will understand our context and will uh, know a little bit about the Victorian Ambulance Cardiac Arrest Registry, but for those who don't, I just want to provide a little bit of context before we move on. And so uh, VACA was established in 1999 and managed uh, under the auspices of Ambulance Victoria, and it records every case of cardiac arrest that's attended by Ambulance Victoria paramedics. And since 1999, it's been able to capture over 110,000 cases of cardiac arrest across the state. It represents a truly roadside to recovery registry um, because it captures information all the way from uh, the resuscitation that occurs at scene all the way through hospital and to 12 months post cardiac arrest where we're now routinely calling patients over the phone and asking them a series of questions to ascertain their quality of life and functional recovery post their cardiac arrest. And what has really contributed to this process, I think, uh, has been the collection very recently of on-scene resuscitation data uh, since 2019 uh, through our uh, ZOL feedback pads and monitor, X-Series monitor, uh, which really allows us to have a lens that we've never had before around resuscitation uh, quality, uh, which has really ultimately been able to uh, lead to the team performance reports or team debriefing reports that we're talking about today. 
And so for those of you who follow me on Twitter or follow one of my colleagues on Twitter, you'll know that over the last uh, 12 months, we've uh, circulated and published um, both negative and positive news in, in the way of our cardiac arrest outcomes in the state of Victoria. And naturally, we've had a very uh, considerable uh, negative impact uh, in our cardiac arrest outcomes associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. But what you may have also seen is the uh, results of our resuscitation quality improvement bundle, which was introduced early in 2019, which involved the introduction or the training of 5,000 uh, paramedics in high performance CPR choreography, manual defibrillation with uh, very narrow pre-shock pauses of less than three seconds. We've been able to achieve this by introducing hands-on charging and a philosophy that if the rhythm recognition was in doubt, the default position was to provide a shock to all patients in arrest. We also introduced real-time CPR monitoring and feedback. Uh, we had a very strong focus on scene leadership and choreography, and we introduced a routine post-event feedback and debriefing tool, which you'll hear a little bit more about today, uh, called our team performance reports. And the results of this intervention were actually very, very reassuring. In fact, uh, we showed that over the first 12 months of the intervention, we saw a 33% risk adjusted improvement in the odds of survival to hospital discharge after the implementation of the intervention. And to put that into absolute terms, what that means is that we saw nine additional survivors per million population as a result of the intervention. Or in the Victorian context, in the first 12 months after implementation, we saw 46 additional survivors going home to their families as a result of this uh, resuscitation quality improvement bundle. And of course, if you read this piece of work, I think it, it's only natural that you'll come to the conclusion that improvements in resuscitation quality were help have helped to drive an increase in the survival rate in this space. But I think what also underpins this work and, and the argument or the point that I'm going to make very passionately today is that there is no such thing as a one-off a quality improvement or, or high performance intervention. Uh, that is that all high performance interventions require a mechanism to be able to monitor to be able to feedback and to be able to improve performance such that you can maintain that initial performance that was present at the time of implementation. And naturally, this brings us to our team performance reports. But I do want to take the opportunity to take a step back for a moment and tell you a little bit about post-cardiac arrest debriefing before talking about our team performance uh, uh, reports and why they're important. And this is a piece of work like a treatment recommendation that was produced by uh, the Education Implementation and Teams Task Force of Ilcor in 2020. And they suggested that based on the evidence that a data-driven performance-focused debriefing of uh, rescuers after out of hospital cardiac arrests is warranted in both adults and, and children or paediatric patients. And that's based on very low certainty evidence. And so I want to give you a, a very a brief snapshot of what that looks like. So this is based on a meta-analysis of four observational studies, of which three of those four observational studies involved in hospital cardiac arrest populations. And they demonstrated by pulling the results of those four studies that, that teams that were exposed to a post-event debriefing had a 40% improvement in survival to hospital discharge compared to teams that weren't exposed to post-cardiac arrest debriefing. They saw similar Similar improvements in ROSC and very minor improvements in compression depth, but they didn't see any improvements in survival with good neurological recovery uh, with compression rate or CPR fraction. And the conclusion was that uh, although the certainty of evidence was low and, and derived largely out of observational studies, the task force acknowledged that the benefits of debriefing are probably likely to significantly outweigh any undesirable effects and also be delivered at a relatively low cost for most health systems, whether they be uh, in the hospital setting or in the emergency medical service setting. And so when we talk about debriefing, we typically think of, of, I think, one of two things. And the one that we typically think most of is hot debriefing. So what is hot debriefing? Hot debriefing occurs immediately after the, the event and, and in the pre-hospital space. That's typically outside of the hospital or outside of the scene where the crews involved in the resuscitation get together to talk about what went right and what went wrong. And I think this is probably occurring in most of our uh, settings across the country at the moment. My main concern with 
a hot debriefing is that it's typically lacked objective data. And my experience, and I know the experience of my colleagues, is that typically hot debriefing is overly focused on what went wrong at scene and not necessarily what went right at scene. And in the absence of objective data, uh, it, it's true that it's, it's not clear how a fixation on something that went wrong can necessarily help to improve someone's performance and in fact may actually uh, get them to fixate on the the error that may or may not be that significant or important in terms of the overall outcome for the patient. We also know that the evidence of effectiveness is limited uh, in the hot debriefing space. And so in comparison, cold debriefing occurs days or potentially even weeks uh, after the event has occurred. Paramedics have had the opportunity to compose themselves, perhaps gather some thoughts and impressions of the resuscitation, what went well and what didn't go well. And they sit down with their teams and potentially a, an intermediate person, a team manager or an educator with objective feedback data, data that's been able to be uh, scrutinized or measured uh, from that resuscitation attempt. And that data is then used to help shape discussions about what went right and what can be improved. And we know from the evidence that this tends to be uh, this tends to be more supported by the evidence-based literature in terms of effectiveness. So the the methodology of uh, and the background to our team performance reports have been published in a letter to the editor uh, in resuscitation last year, and uh, they describe our implementation of the team performance reports in a large EMS system, an EMS system that is typically low resourced and potentially doesn't really have the time to facilitate structured debriefing processes routinely uh, at the scene or after uh, after arrival at hospital or at some time later down the track. And so this is about uh, integrating a resuscitation officer uh, within, uh, within our department who's been able to scrutinize thousands of cases every year based on these performance metrics collect that data, embed it back into the registry, and then be able to produce an electronic report that is automatically emailed out to paramedics on scene or the paramedics who were on scene at that resuscitation attempt, their team managers, and potentially even their, their educators on scene to be able to then formalise those discussions at some point later in the event. So most of these cases are adjudicated by the resuscitation officer within 72 hours of the case being embedded into the registry. And typically the report is issued within seven days of the, of the event occurring. And to be able to facilitate this process, we're using uh, predominantly uh, treatment data that's collected from the patient care record. But most of the data uh, has actually been gained by the lens that we've been able to create on scene by having real-time CPR quality recording of cardiac arrest cases, uh, thanks to our Zoll X-Series and of course our, our, our feedback pads. And so what are the 19 metrics that we collect? Well, we started off with 30 metrics and after a three month trial and error process, we realized that about 19 metrics we could objectively measure and, and it was feasible to report uh, in an ongoing fashion. Uh, and those 19 metrics really target all aspects of the chain of survival. And they include things like the uh, time of pad placements, where the compressions were visible at the time that the pads went on the patient. Of course, we've got quality CPR metrics, including recall velocity, the time to first defibrillation, delays in terms of CPR fraction, pre and post shock for pauses, the time to key intervention such as adrenaline and amiodarone if it was indicated, whether an adequate duration of resuscitation was provided on scene. And then in terms of our post resuscitation care, we're interested in, in, in knowing that our intubations were successful on first pass, uh, whether our, our time was between ROSC and capture of a 12 lead ECG, whether the patient arrived to a PCI capable hospital if it was indicated, and whether their blood pressure was greater than or equal to 100. These are the metrics that we're currently reporting in our team performance reports and are helping to shape debriefing that is currently occurring around our resuscitations. So one of the things about our team performance reports that I think is a little bit unique is that we benchmark ourselves so that we set internal historical benchmarks on our performance and then we try and 
uh, beat those benchmarks moving forward. And the reason we've done that is because we learned very quickly that by setting international benchmarks based on the medical literature uh, really undermines what we're trying to do. And if I can give you one example, it's around CPR fraction, where if you look at the medical literature, most of the uh, studies will tell you that it's somewhere between 60 and 80 percent CPR fraction is, is achievable by a cruise on scene but we're actually already achieving somewhere between 90 and 92% in our resuscitation attempts. And to set a benchmark that you've therefore already achieved or you can already surpass doesn't really provide any benefit in terms of trying to shift performance forward uh, year on year. And so we've provided historical benchmarks. We can track very closely on how we're, uh, how we're performing year on year with respect to uh, the benchmarks that were set in the previous year. And I guess, uh, to summarise that, then really the the only endpoint that we're trying to achieve in this process is really excellence, uh, and it's this sort of idea that you know you set a benchmark, once you've bet it, you need to beat the next benchmark, and so you're just naturally trying to shift your performance to the higher end. We're using a traffic light system, red amber and green. Green means the top 20th percentile compared to historical performance. Amber means the top 50th percentile uh, compared to historical performance. And if you get a red light uh, for that particular metric, then you rank in the bottom 50th percentile. Now, our benchmarks are updated every 12 months and they're based on the previous 12 months uh, performance. So they're naturally contemporary benchmarks that are updated every year. So this is a view of our team performance reports and currently uh, we've got several uh, thousands of these being issued to our paramedics and you'll see colour coding that sits uh, along this column which represents actual performance. This is the target performance and the target performance is the target of the top 20th percentile performance that you're trying to achieve and you can see in this particular case how that crew is performed in this particular patient which was actually a patient that survived uh, to hospital and achieved ROSC and so importantly some of the post resuscitation care uh, elements or metrics are also populated for this case as well. Our crews also get in their team performance report a snapshot out of the Zoll defibrillator monitor. And so it gives them a, a really nice overview, particularly around some of the CPR quality metrics, such as rate, uh, such as uh, depth, to see when those metrics were actually provided according to uh, uh, according to the targets that we set. And you can see in certain cases, whoever was performing uh, CPR to begin with in this particular case, for instance, had a rate that was a little bit too fast to begin with. And maybe whoever was performing CPR second had a depth that was a little bit too shallow as well. So this gives us an opportunity to be able to address exactly who was performing CPR and to actually give the crew on scene a little bit of visibility uh, uh, days or weeks after the event in terms of some of these metrics so they can put those pieces together in terms of their debriefing. So what's the scope of the team debriefing reports in Victoria where we're currently reporting almost 85% of all attempted resuscitations will receive a team performance report and there are a few exclusions. We're currently not doing paediatrics because their targets differ. We don't do trauma because uh, priorities differ in that particular scenario. We don't do patients who are not for resuscitation. And we also don't issue a team performance report when a resuscitation attempt is withheld within two minutes, typically because evidence of futility is established in the first two minutes after a resuscitation attempt is um, uh, is commenced. One important thing we do do is that we, we we issue a report even if we can benchmark a single metric. And our view is that if we can provide information around one objective metric, then that's enough for us to issue a team performance report. And of course, we're, we're issuing about 150 to 200 reports a month. Uh, and every month we have about 700 email recipients that receive these team performance reports. So how does it work? Well, a case is identified uh, by the registry and then within 72 hours, our resuscitation officer then scrutinise those, uh, scrutinises that case. Uh, once that case is scrutinised, the data is inputted back into the registry and then we export it all out of the registry uh, at the end of a two week or, or a week period and we can then automatically generate up to 200 PDF reports within 10 minutes. And then we mail merge those reports to individual 
paramedics based on their employee numbers. And we have a, a spreadsheet that allows us to identify who a paramedics managers uh, direct managers are such that we can email those reports not only to the paramedics who attended the scene but also their reporting managers so that we can provide that objective data for those discussions that are occurring on scene and fundamentally the 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 output of these reports is to try and shape those discussions that are currently occurring at the uh, at the local level or the branch level and so we've shown very significant improvements, I think, uh, uh, following the first year of our implementation out of the 13 non-binary metrics uh, that we're currently capturing in our team performance reports. We've been able to improve eight of those metrics. Three metrics, particularly around CPR fraction and perishock pauses declined. And bearing in mind, this is uh, during the time of COVID-19 pandemic occurring. And two other metrics uh, did not change uh, from the first year to the next. And to give you a bit of an example as to how this changed, our compressions uh, at target depth improved by 3%. Our compressions at target rate improved from 59% to 71%. Um, but uh, we also saw reductions in performance around pre-shock and post-shock pause at the median and CPR fraction at the median reduced from 92% to 90%. We do ongoing monitoring in the way of our regional reports that go to our area level managers and, uh, and also our VACAR steering committee uh, members routinely monitor high performance CPR metrics uh, on a quarterly basis. And they sort of reflect uh, both regional reporting over time, so over quarters, uh, and that, we, that way we can closely track how our regions are performing in the way of CPR quality metrics moving forward. We've also been able to establish our metric of the month uh, newsletters, which puts a, a high performance CPR metric in the spotlight every month. And it highlights the evidence base underpinning each of the metrics. It also provides our current internal performance data with a particular focus on regional disparities and provides some case studies with particular insights around avoidable performance delays and clinical pearls. And I think this has been one of the fantastic initiatives that's um, uh, that's been a direct result of these team performance reports being implemented in Victoria. And so to finish off, I want to leave you with a, a couple of thoughts about where to now. Um, I think the, the most important thing that we need to address uh, out of these team performance reports is that we've taken the first step in what I believe to be a multi-step intervention around debriefing. And so we've been able to provide objective data to shape discussions at the local or the branch level, somewhat you know, days or weeks after the event. The issue we have now is to understand what the quality of those discussions are and how we can shape those discussions to try and achieve maximal buy-in uh, by paramedics who attend those resuscitations. And my huge concern, my number one concern out of those uh, out of those discussions is that we tend to overly focus on the negative and not focus enough on the positive. And where I would certainly like to see fundamental improvements in, in terms of discussions at the local level is that if team managers and paramedic educators do nothing else but to send somebody an email and acknowledge the, 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 the quality of the performance of that particular case, and I think that is the best thing that we could possibly get out of, out of these resuscitation attempts that we potentially have never had insight on before. Um, number two is that um, we need to optimise the timing of these reports and we acknowledge that ourselves. So we're currently achieving a, a report issue time of about seven days, but we really need to issue the report within the first three days. And so moving forward, we'll really try and focus on our mechanisms that sit behind that to try and improve the efficiency uh, of these reports. We need to validate our metrics. We need to understand a little bit more about what we know to be important and what is not important. And we also need to understand how those metrics improve our outcomes. And in particular, how our uh, metrics might be shaped by incidents such as COVID-19, which can also particularly have an impact on, uh, uh, on both CPR performance, but also our patient outcomes. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure to present to you. I hope you've all taken away a little bit uh, from this presentation. I'm uh, uh, looking forward to uh, to your questions. Hi, Z. How are you? Good. How are you? Excellent. Nice, Z. Uh, great presentation. Uh, thanks so much. And as always, thank you again for always supporting the CAA in these activities. Firstly, um, I think it's really important to to note that in the words of Mickey Eisenberg, you know, one of his mantras, you know, 
measure to improve. And this is just one of those excellent examples of uh, taking measurement to the next level, really, and providing data and feedback to, to paramedics in order for them to improve their clinical practice, which is, which is amazing. And uh, I think a big shout out to the research team at Amlets Victoria. Uh, world class, you do some amazing research that just changes the face about a hospital cardiac arrest around the world. So I think on behalf of everybody listening today, watching today, uh, thanks to the AV team for the research you do. And it's a great presentation, uh, some amazing findings. But what I noted most of all is there's um, a huge culture change required every time a service introduces a new form of measurement. Everybody within your service, I would imagine, think they're operating at the best of their ability. And then to be given a new device, a new piece of equipment, a new way of measurement, which shows that there, there is this great opportunity to improve, culturally must be quite a shock. And I'm just keen to understand how an organization of the size of Amlets Victoria manages that shift. Yeah, David, I think this is probably the most important, uh, the, the million dollar question, if you like. And, you know, I think when you're given a, um, when you're given a lens into what's happening on scene, you then have the responsibility of determining how you're going to use that lens. And obviously, this is quite a lot of um, data that we're collecting from the scene, uh, uh, you know, data that we've never really had before. I think the question for our organisation and certainly for those people watching for watching their organisations as well to really understand how best to use that data, whether we use that data to identify competency errors and then, you know, take potentially a clinical audit pathway to trying uh, to try to mediate those errors or do we take a, a debriefing path, pathway for, for um, those resuscitations and in fact just try to provide some uh, a critical improvement um, around improving some of those uh, outcomes. I know which, which direction I would take and I make the point very strongly that um, for those organisations that are conducting clinical audit uh, at the moment that is an important safety mechanism for patients but it doesn't necessarily improve performance. And in my mind, the best way to improve performance is to provide feedback uh, on those resuscitations that is non-punitive. So there are non-punitive non outcomes at the end of that deep briefing. And most importantly, to change or shift the culture such that it, it becomes a mechanism of feedback where the vast majority of people are actually receiving praise for their performance. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not being criticised. And I think that is fundamentally important in shifting and actually buying, getting paramedics to buy into the process, which is, you know, it's going to take, it's going to take some years. We're not there yet. Um, and I think it'll take some time before we actually start seeing that sort of buy-in from paramedics into this process. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, one of the lessons we took out of the Resuscitation Academy and from Seattle was the importance of recognizing paramedics when they have a survivor but also i think what you're saying is we need to recognize paramedics when they don't have a survivor but they've done everything in a textbook fashion and met all those criteria but haven't unfortunately got the patient back how does an organization find the time to do this and find time to re-engage with paramedics to provide that feedback i know that's a question many people are probably thinking about at the moment is like we just don't have the time how yeah. do you do that yeah look you know if you look at the way we used to provide feedback in 2019 most of it was being done by our, our senior clinical leaders our clinical support officers um, and often a lot of that time was was paid to them as sort of overtime, you know, outside of their normal clinical mm -hmm. roles. And it was actually quite expensive. It was also not very efficient because the process required them to sit down to review a case and then to provide perhaps a, a report or a letter to those individual teams. And as such, we could really only achieve, uh, you know, about 20 percent uh, feedback in terms of all of our attempted resuscitation, uh, attempted resuscitations. And so what we've been able to do because of the mechanisms that sit behind the way that we report with team the team performance report is we've been able to make that process so much more efficient that it actually just takes a single resuscitation officer embedded into the registry and the reports themselves are somewhat automated so we can basically uh, a batch send uh, 200 reports a month to paramedics. It makes the process far more efficient uh, and therefore you can provide feedback to uh, to improve the greatest number of people, if you like, or the greatest number of resuscitations. Uh, so so yeah, I mean, considerable improvements. I think 
in, in technology have been able to drive that um, uh, within the registry. Oh, that's great. And and I think it, in, at the end of the day, it's the only way you you could with the numbers of uh, cases you're dealing with is to automate yep. it to a degree. Graham, welcome. Nice to see you. Um, middle of the night for you, I'm thinking. Uh, we really enjoyed your presentation. It's an amazing piece of work. Really looking forward to Vans 2 to see what comes out of that. One of the questions um, I posed to Z, and it's, it's, it's as relevant for your piece of research as well is, you know, paramedics in their day-to-day -day practice truly, you know, and, um, you know, believe they're doing the best they can, the best practice, and then to be given a, a, an amazing piece of device, relatively small piece, small device that certainly provides them with a whole lot of information to show them how much better they could be doing. How do you manage that culture shift? I think you've got to be gentle with people. Um... People want to do the best. They, they, they want to do the best they can for their patients. They have honourable intentions. They do the best they can with the tools they have available at the time. Yes, finding out you're not as good as at something as you thought you were is always going to be a little bit of a, a challenge, a little bit of a shock. But we've had the same sort of thing with chest compression feedback. We've had the same sort of thing. If we look back historically, when we've introduced other devices and other tools to support people, and at the end of the day, this, this, that's what this is, trying to give people feedback which they can use, apply, and improve the practice with. And I think people get back at the end of the day. I was looking at your uh, findings, and I think you said uh, somewhere in the region of, I think, 98% of people or paramedics said it was great, wonderful. But there was a slight reduction around whether they would use it in their practice. I just wondered if, if there were some learnings or insights in relation to that and what other organizations might think to, to maximize uh, paramedic uptake. The qualitative findings, the sort of survey findings were very positive in terms of how you overcome people's reluctance, give them time, show them the benefits, let them get used to things. It, it's another thing to add into what is a, you know, a very busy, pressured environment where people are juggling a lot of information and is always challenging whenever anything new is added into that. Mm. So show them the benefits, let them get used to it, address concerns, if, whatever those concerns may be. And uh, any insights into what Vans 2 might show us or too early to say? Too early to say. We will have the results from Vans 2 shortly. It'll take us a little while to get things written up and presented as unfortunately is is the way with these things changing things from simulation to real life clinical practice is always it's always going to be difficult but it's the goal isn't it just because we can do it in simulation it doesn't doesn't mean we can do it the same in practice we need to demonstrate we can do this in practice and it makes a difference in practice see um i was really impressed by your reporting i was really um impressed by was the you know the metrics of the month and um, I can see the power of that information. How's that being received? And um, have you had any responses from your teams in relation to that? Yeah, look, I think it's been received really well. And uh, I've just had a, an email from our resuscitation officer, Belinda Dellards, who, um, who leads this really important work. And she's already thinking about what the next metric of the month is going to focus on. But that's one of the beautiful things about, you know, about collecting data is that when you start to facilitate multiple methods of feedback, whether they be at a system level, at the individual or paramedic level, um, you know, these are really powerful mechanisms of feedback that can really help to drive performance. And one of the, one of the really special things that we do about metric of the month is we, uh, we give paramedics uh, an overview of what the underlying evidence base internationally is, is around that particular metric. But we also tell them how we're performing internally. So we have a, a, a contemporary and, and real time uh, comparison, if you like, to how the rest of the world is performing. And then we look at areas of improvement where we haven't done so well and where potentially we have done so well and why we've done so well. So looking at potentially errors or mistakes that we've made during the resuscitation process that we could mitigate by, by changing our approaches, but also looking at the ways some paramedics have been able to uh, achieve really high performance by thinking about those mitigations along the way. Uh, and in doing so, you know, we've now created a, a newsletter mechanism that potentially, you know, not only can focus just on the metrics that we report on, but potentially can address other things outside of that 
uh, outside of the 19 metrics that we're currently reporting on. So it's really powerful. We, we're getting quite a lot of circulation through through the organisation with that newsletter, but I think it'll become more powerful with time as we've just uh, really launched it in the last uh, in the last three or so months. Excellent. I'm sure it's uh, information some other services would love to have the opportunity to, to read at some point when you're able to share that. Absolutely. Yeah. Love to. One of the things I've observed is, uh, you know, paramedics are inherently um, competitive and you know, the more data they receive, the more they want to improve on their data. Yes. Is that is that an observation that's yes. uh, real? Yep. Yeah, and I, you know, I think I said in the uh, in the presentation, you know, if you know, for for our team managers and our, our clinical educators and clinical leaders, the the most important thing is that you know, all paramedics are adult learners. We're we're all professionals. Once you give a paramedic a report that provides objective benchmarks, they don't need to be told that they've done that they've done badly. What they need to be told is is where they've done really well. And once you actually get that buy in and say, guys, you've done really well, uh, you know, across the board then really an adult learner, a professional, should be able to look at the report and say, okay, I've done really well, but I can see areas where I can improve. And so we don't really need to overly focus and be critical on someone's performance. They can do that themselves and often they do and they lead that work in the future uh, to try and improve their performance uh, without you needing to tell them. But what we do need to do is we need to buy into the process. And the only way we can achieve that is actually by you know, by providing some praise. Uh, and so if I, yeah, if I say anything to any clinical managers out there, the most important thing to drive prefer, uh, performance is to get paramedics to buy into a debriefing process so they can uh, they can feel some praise about the feedback they're getting and everything else will really occur on its own. My closing question to both of you really is, how have you been able to do this during this period of you know the last two years in a COVID environment, how have you how have you succeeded in continuing to do the level of research and the quality that you've both been able to achieve? I've been very lucky to have people who supported me and a team within the service where I work in in the northeast here in the UK who've understood that despite the challenges of the last couple of years, that that hasn't been the only problem and problems were there before COVID, during COVID, and will still be there after COVID, and that we needed to carry on working on other issues as well. And we were lucky that we were given the sort of the chance to work on challenges other than COVID at the time, and I'm quite glad we, we did. Oh, look, I, you know, much the same. I'm hugely supported by just a... Um... Uh, an amazing team you know I have a bit of a thought bubble and I go to my boss Professor Karen Smith and I say look this is this is my thought bubble it's going to take a little bit of work but you know I'd really like to push it and she says absolutely um, uh, you know always very supportive and then I've got absolute superstars like our resuscitation officer Belinda Dallards at the moment who you know leads the bulk of this work and actually uh, um, uh, makes it possible and does all the all the grunt work um, and yeah, uh, without them, um, I think uh, these sort of initiatives will just never be realised. A uh, huge thank you, um, Graham and Z, for giving up your time uh, for this webinar. We really do appreciate it. It's just um, invaluable information. I'm sure many of our attendees have taken a lot from this. And of course, a big thank you to Zoll, who made this possible by supporting our speakers um, and um, providing the amazing equipment they do to enable the measurement to occur. No worries. And, um, and for those attendees, our next webinar uh, coming up on the 22nd of March um, is uh, a woman in leadership um, seminar. And we have an excellent speaker, um, Julie. Some of you would have seen Julie at our Perth conference at our, our Women in Leadership um, program. Um, can I encourage you all to join us on the 22nd of March? And um, I will see you then. Again, thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you for attending the Real-Time Clinical Feedback to Improve Clinical Practice webinar. Presented by Dr. Gray McClellan and Dr. Ziad Neem. Proudly supported by Zoll. Join us for our next webinar on Tuesday, the 22nd of March at 11am Australian Eastern Daylight Time. For Women in Leadership, Real Women Fix Each Other's Crowns. Presented by Julie Pantadossi and proudly supported by Total Coaching Academy. You can view all of our upcoming webinars by visiting www.caa.net.au backslash webinars. Be sure to follow us on social media to keep up to date. 
Twitter at CAA Australasia, Facebook and LinkedIn, the Council of Ambulance Authorities Australasia. Thanks for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time.